Well, hello, 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 everyone. I'm Alvin King, host of He Said, He Said, He Said, a look at the world from a seasoned Black man's perspective. It is Friday, March the 29th, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone has had a great week. And speaking of great weeks, it is Holy Week, ladies and gentlemen. It is Easter, is on Sunday. And uh, I know for all of you Christians and all of you who have a spiritual side to you and who celebrate uh, Holy Week. Um, I hope that you have done it well and that you are partaking in all the festivities and, and you know, things that are associated with Holy Week. Um, I am looking forward actually to being in church on Sunday, something that I don't think for Easter that I have done since uh, COVID. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but. Welcome to our show tonight. Uh, we are so excited that you are here. And for all of you who know that I am a fan, this week, the actress, legendary solo singer, and lead singer for the iconic girl group, The Supremes, Diana Ross, turned 80 years old on March the 26th. Um, Miss Ross, as we call her in my house, is a national treasure, treasure with a magnificent legacy that has changed the course of music history and popular culture. Ms. Ross would help to create national cultural movement, the natural, national cultural movement, and become the, the premier artist at the renowned Motown Records. She is still touring at 80 years old, and she has just launched a national campaign for Yves Saint Laurent, the brand, ladies and gentlemen. I salute my girl today at 80 years old, and you should too. Happy birthday, Miss Diana Ross. I'm, oh, God, I, I'm, you all have no idea how much of a fan, but if I am, but if you follow my social media, you know that I tend to wear a lot of Diana Ross paraphernalia. So, about our show tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you all who have been tuning in for our March for Art series. And tonight we conclude our series and we are doing it on such a high note tonight. And we're gonna end our series with visual artist Desmond Beach. He is here. His work is absolutely incredible. I mean, it has been a wonderful series. And so I am honored to be closing the show with Desmond tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And it is still, Women's History Month, and we are honoring someone in the arts. Miss uh, Amy Sherrill is an acclaim is acclaimed for her profoundly creative and distinctive portraits of African American subjects. In 2017, she received the commission to paint former First Lady Michelle Obama's official portrait for the Smithsonian Natural Portrait Gallery, unveiled on February uh, in 2018. She was born in Columbus, Georgia, in 1973. She was trained as a painter at, in Atlanta and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Clark Atlanta University. Following a Spelman College International Artist in Residence program in Portobello, Panama, she went on to receive her master's degree in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Art. And in, 2000, in 2008, Amy returned to Baltimore to refocus on her practice and her work to gained national attention in 2011 when the National Museum of Women in the Arts acquired one of her paintings. In 2016, Cheryl was the first woman to win the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery's Outwin Bouchever Portrait Competition for the 2014 painting, Miss Everything. And a company next exhibition, the Outwin 2016 has been on tour since 2016 and opened in the Ackland Art Museum University of North Carolina in 2018. The New York Times selected Cheryl among 19 artists to watch in 2017, and she is still going strong. Ladies and gentlemen, for Women's History Month, we are honoring Amy Cheryl tonight. Beautiful, beautiful woman. Beautiful woman, beautiful woman. Um, so if you all are ready, we have, like I said, an excellent show for you tonight. And let's get on with the chat. Hello, boys. Hey. How oh. you? You oh, know, wow. you know what? You know, you know. I, I don't know. I, who, I, I don't know who that was, but I, I, it just keeps coming around. 
And <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Good Friday. Good, Good Friday. Good Friday. How you guys doing tonight? <laughs> hey guys. Good. Good. Happy Good Friday. Oh, let me see some folks that are in here. I'm sorry. I was looking at, at another screen. Gregory Bruce Great. is here. Kendall Fisher is here. George is here. Monica is here. Thank you all for, for, for joining us tonight. Happy Good Friday to, to all of you. How are you boys doing? I you know, I do have a, a question and a problem. Has anyone else's skin been so dry this last week? Just me? All right, because I've had to put Crisco on my body to keep my skin from getting dry. I just had to just see whether it was just me or Did whether you say it was Crisco? Me. Pretty much, pretty, pretty much. much. I am just putting on like lotion and oil just to keep my skin. I'm just, just wondering if anyone else was experiencing it. Well, you know, I was willing to leave you out there to be all dry by yourself, but there, <laughs> it is. I think, yeah, the, the change in the weather, and I think the drastic shifts in change of weather, of okay. like 70 one day and 49 the next. Um, I, I too have been applying a little extra uh, Nivea and uh, other lotion to, to keep me not being ashy, so I get it. Thank you, thank you. And what's not dry, Okay, <laughs> are, the, are the airways okay? Because no. Beyonce dropped her new album, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today, and people are going crazy. When I say cray cray, they are going crazy, and I am one of them. Beyonce, ladies and gentlemen, dropped her new um CD today, and Cowboy Carter, and it is absolutely off the chain. I mean, when I tell you my earlobes were seduced by this CD, I am not exaggerating. It is done so well. I'm just going to say, please get it. Listen to it. This woman has proven that she's a genius, you know, and all I can say is if you get a chance, listen to it. It is all that. I just need to give her some kudos right now because she did that. She did that. I have not heard it yet, but I look forward to hearing it. Yeah, please, please do. Well, Gregory has said a couple of things. One, he loves the beer. Thank you. Oh, he said the album. <laughs> the other thing y'all can talk about if you want, but I just love that you love the beer, Gregory. Well, I'm going to say this to Gregory because Gregory's <laughs> right here. Gregory, what was it, three years ago when um, Renaissance dropped? Gregory, I heard it one time and came on here yes, you did. and went so far in. Yes that I had to literally, <laughs> I mean, shut down one of my social media accounts because people were like, what are you talking about? I mean, but, um, but you know, to each his own. And Gregory, I, I hope you listen to it twice and, um, and it sounds better the second time. But um, thank you all for, for being here tonight. I just had to give uh, Beyonce a, um, you know, a, a little kudo. Um, but on a serious tip, ladies and gentlemen, this has not been a good week especially for the city of Baltimore. Mm. As some of you uh, may or may not know, uh, on Monday, the um, Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed in Baltimore. A cargo ship uh, lost power and rammed into a major bridge uh, in Baltimore. And that was like early Tuesday morning, destroying the, a span in a matter of seconds and plunging into the river in a terrifying collapse that could disrupt a vital shipping port for months. Six people mm -hmm. uh, were presumed dead. I, I think at this time, two bodies have been found and um, it is just devastating. I live in DC and so I have driven past that bridge many times and for what we've seen, did you all see the footage of what happened or when the bridge was collapsing on TV? Did you all yeah. see any of that? Yeah. It looked like a toy. Yeah, it was devastating. And, and you know, I, I too am here in the D.C. area and I know that it was getting national attention. But before it was even getting national attention, you could imagine it was pretty much all we were seeing here in the D.C. area. So, yeah. And, and to see, as I think I pointed out to you guys when we were talking earlier in the week, to actually see that last car that made it across the bridge. And then literally seconds after that, you saw the lights go by. You could see the bridge collapse. It is, I, when I look at some of the folks that are on the news who live in Baltimore, who saw the bridge as a landscape, yeah, they are having issues. Mm -hmm. 
with not seeing the bridge anymore. I mean, and I guess, you know, that if if you are somebody, you know, who's afraid one, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But um, if you're afraid of bridges, you know, that that could have a, an impact on, on itself. But um, in addition to, well, with all of this that is happening, there is an economic fallout from all of this because, you know, um, the, the bridge, it, it does a lot, not only for the city of Baltimore, but the bridge collapse will not mean it, the, the impact to the U.S. economy. It will not, you know, put us into a recession or anything like that. But the ramifications from it, because of what goes in and out of Baltimore, is it, it may impact us and and some of the you know some of the things that 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 we do. And Governor Westmore has been very good about you know detailing um, you know what the impact of that, you know, was all about. He mm -hmm. said Port of Baltimore set a record last year for the amount of foreign cargo handled at this point of the entry. And in all, the port handled 52.3 tons or $8 billion worth of foreign cargo, making it the ninth busiest port in, in the country last year for such goods. And uh, we, I don't think we've seen the actual fallout economically from it. But mm -hmm. a lot of, um, you know, a lot goes through that port. But also what's really the economic piece for me that's kind of devastating is that 15,000 jobs mm -hmm. depend directly on that port. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, you know, 140 jobs are linked to its activities. 140,000. Job right. linked to its activity. So it's, it's, it's devastating. And I, I just find it really sad. And it was an accident. I know, I think, I hope, but it happened. It happened. The, the ripple effect is going to be intense because not only just are the people that are connected to the port, ships that would come into the port, but then you have all the support services that go into that. As well, I mean, there's just going to be an ongoing ripple effect. They said it took five years just to get the bridge built. They can't even predict how long it's going to take to either replace it or come up with a workaround. So things are about to change dramatically up and down the Eastern seaboard because of this. Yeah, and one uh, situation in particular, it's been noted to be one of the major ports for automobile um, uh, transfer uh, on the East Coast as well. So just uh, cars alone, uh, the access to to getting cars in there. But but you you made a very good point in terms of that ripple effect because when you think about there uh, there are people who provide food for people who work there. There are people who you know like it's it's not just the people who work there, but as you were saying, all of those support services that make that a viable uh, place of employment. Um, are all called into question right now. So yeah, it's hmm. it's it's not a, not a good thing. And what and I also heard was that the transportation of gas and oil is going to be dramatically impacted because mm -hmm. uh, tankers can't drive through the tunnels right to Correct. distribute some of the fuel and petroleum products that are going around. So you know we got to just hold on and see what's going to happen. I'm going to say praise God for that because I take that that tunnel quite a bit. I'm back and forth in Baltimore and I'm already kind of, you know, going in tunnels and stuff like that kind mm -hmm. of give me, you know, a little heebie-jeebie. But to the, uh, thank God these trucks can't go through there. But anyway, mm -hmm. the impact of the bridge collapse is um, a lot more serious than some of us think. Um, and, you know, just because we're not in Baltimore, trust right. me, we will feel the effects of that. But we also must note that as devastating as the loss of life was for those who, who mm -hmm. perished in this accident, the, mm -hmm. the, the reality of it is as well that had that bridge been occupied at its normal capacity, it could have been overwhelmingly devastating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was 1.30 in the morning. Can mm -hmm. you imagine four hours later with people going to work? Exactly. It was a month. It was a Monday morning. Right. And yeah, that that could have been, you know, really bad. But I'm also I do want to say also on this that the response, quick thinking of the police or whomever, you know, got the Mayday call and stopped the cars from oh, going sure. over the, the bridge. You know, that was they are to be commended also. I've saved because, it. yeah, yeah, they they saved a, 
even the lives that were out there that night. So, yeah, but this is it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy. crazy. We'll, hear more. we'll be talking about this, I think, for some time to come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's huge. It's definitely huge. Well, and talking about it in different ways because, you know, we've got the actual event itself, but already you have people politicizing this in various ways, right? So there's a the Utah rep, Phil Lyman, seems to already be trying to blame diversity, equity, and inclusion mm. for the collapse of the bridge. Uh, on a post on his ex account, he says, this is what happens when you have governors who prioritize diversity over the well-being and security of citizens. Now, what he was doing was drawing attention to the fact that Corinthia Barber, one of six commissioners overseeing the Port of Baltimore, has a background in diversity, equity, and belonging. Now, a separate diversity equity consultant, Nika White, said that Lyman's assertions were not only irresponsible, they were anti-Black, anti-woman, and also profoundly misguided. Mm. Now, Lyman told the Salt Lake City Tribune his social media team posted that comment, but he's neither retracted it nor disputed it. He's going to blame it on the edit. Now, I just want to say right up front, we handle the, he said, he said, he said, social media. So if we say you ugly, you ugly. <laughs> he, however, needs to check his team because it, yes. the bridge collapse is just another string of problems that right-wing activists are trying to blame on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and calling any failure of government, of investments, institutions, engineering, business, all are being blamed on DEI initiatives. And it's the code for, you see how, what happens when you put a black person in a position instead of a white person? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, all they are really doing is showing their bias, their ignorance, and their willingness to say anything to get votes and to support white supremacy, colonialism, and the patriarchy. We got to call them out on it. Amen. As as you did so eloquently, and I'm gonna pass, <laughs> I'm gonna pass this cup as you did. Yeah, that 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 that's st- you know for for that to play out during the bridge collapse is just so utterly ridiculous, but so GOP. And it's so good that it's happening because it's the more they do it and the more blatant they are about it, the mm-hmm. more people just get to see that it really has. This woman, Corinthia Barber, is one of six people on the commission. But she's singled out. Two are black. She's black. There's another black man. And the other four are white. Why, why, why isn't one of them being called into question? Why aren't they all being called into question? First of all, unless they were on the boat, driving the boat, or supposed to be in one of the tugboats that should have been guiding that boat through the bridge. Yeah. It happened at 1.30 in the morning. She, what, was she supposed to be like leaving the club and going there and telling them what to do? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just too much. I, I was getting ready to say something. I was getting ready to say, but maybe <laughs> it, being that it was so late, <laughs> he would have had something else to say if she was out there. And yeah. You could do no right. With I'm going to say folks. that. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just going to leave that. That's how you go to the bridge, ladies and gentlemen, but don't jump. Okay, Uh-oh. you all know what I'm talking about. Right. Well, you know, it leads into my little portion of this discussion as well in terms of it continuing beyond that council person and actually focusing more on the highest level of leadership in Baltimore, that being of Governor Westmore and uh, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott, uh, recently responding to some of the bizarre criticism from conservatives. Now, uh, on MSNBC's The Readout uh, with host Joy Reid, uh, he prefaced, she prefaced her interview with Scott, who is Black, by calling attention to a tweet describing Scott as Baltimore's DEI mayor. Um, and the post, which re- references the acronym that stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, and just suggesting that he was kind of like an affirmative action hire, that no one actually elected him to that point. And then she went on to say um, that, indeed, uh, Mayor Scott was elected with 70% of the vote in 2020 um, in a city that is 61% Black. He received 70% of the vote. Um, and she said to, to Mayor Scott, if you'd like to address this quote unquote tomfoolery, please go ahead. Mayor Scott went on to say, I know, and we all know, and you know very well that Black men and young Black, young black men in particular 
have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only straight, wealthy, white men should have a say in anything. Um, we've been the boogeyman for them since the first day they brought us to this country. He, along with uh, Governor Wes Moore, who have both been applauded by many for their leadership and their quick response to this situation, their commitment to support um, the, those families that have been affected, um, the state, um, they have been called out in many ways for their, for their good work. They're also under constant attack. And it reminds me very, very much of the similarities in terms of some of the attacks that former President Obama, as well as Michelle Obama, received during their time of leadership. Criticism for just wearing a tan suit, um, calling uh, her unladylike because her official portrait was in a dress with no sleeves. Um, you know, the ongoing attack against those people of color in leadership positions um, is, is, is relentless, it's exhausting, um, and we have to speak up, as Vash was saying, speak up and out against it because when hate speaks, love must speak louder. Love needs a pimp slap. Love. <laughs> first of all, you, just at the first, ready. First love. of all, you have to you have to have it in order to slap it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and 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 we are in need of so much love. And first of all, I'm just gonna say thank you. I mean, I, I know the bridge collapse is a huge, it's a huge, huge uh, thing that's going on, but these three points that we wanted to share with you all, ladies and gentlemen, I mean these all of these came out of one bridge collapse, okay? All of this, and it just seems so unnecessary to me when the main focus should be on saving lives and making sure that, you know, that the people who were, I mean, directly impacted by the bridge collapse are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And then you have these people who are going in all these different directions, spewing hate, as, hey, as you said, you know. Cool. And it's just crazy. It's crazy. And the conspiracy but, theories, because people, yes. I mean, as I, I only touched on the fact that people are listening, where were the tugboats that should have been accompanying that ship as it was leaving the port? You know, people have been drawn a lot of attention to that. And I kind of agree. Anybody who's worked around like ports, you know that when a ship's coming in, there's usually tugboats that are guiding them just in case anything were to happen. So more shall be revealed. Yes. Yeah. And before we leave, are you all, do you all have a fear of bridges? No. Because I do. And I mean, I have it bad. Mm. And uh, uh, viewers, if you all are on here and you have a fear of bridges, there is a term for it. It's called g phobia. And so if you all have a fear of bridges, let, let me put That's that right. in, the, in the chat. Say yes or no, or Alvin, heck yes, yeah, or whatever you want to say. But I have a serious fear of going over bridges. And so to see that bridge collapse, it yeah. has set me back probably 10 years, okay, with going over a bridge because I don't, I'm not looking forward to going over the Bay Bridge anytime soon, yeah. okay? How about that? I'm not, I'm just not. Oh, look, yes, I, I hear you, Herbert. I, I, I'm, I'm I, have, I, I don't feel comfortable when I'm on them for extended periods of time. Like I, I can drive across them, um, I, and I, again, I shared with you guys my first trip driving to Key West and driving across that seven mile bridge, you know, after about mile three, you're like, okay, I'm, I've been on a bridge for a long time. Like it literally is named the seven mile bridge because it is a very, very, very long bridge. I love driving across bridges and being that close and seeing the water and the view and everything. Mm. I know I'm 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 alone here. And Alvin, can you say what the phobia is again? Because I think my cousin's name is that. Say it again. You say say what the name of it is. Yeah, it is it is pronounced G phobia. Yeah, your my... cousin's name is that. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kendall said that he will drive me. Thank you, Kendall. I really pre I see. That's what I wanted to hear from somebody. That Alvin will take you over the bridge. That's all I would. I'm glad Kendall said it. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all for it. <laughs> thank you all for indulgence. Are you guys ready um, for our special guest tonight? Because um, we, we've been waiting for him for actually a month. Because I think we reached out to, to Desmond early. And so he is here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Desmond Beach is here. And if you all okay with it, I want to go ahead and give him his introduction. You guys ready? I'm so excited. So excited.
All right, our special guest, Desmond Beach, is a New York City artist and educator who explores race, identity, and social justice themes in his artistic practice. Through his work, Beach aims to transform the tragedies of the Desmond trans transatlantic slave trade and the Jim Crow America South into a celebration of fully living Black life. He holds an M MFA from the Reinhardt School of Sculpture at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where he also obtained his BFA. Currently, Beach is pursuing a PhD in creative practice at the University of Plymouth in England. His research delves into healing pathways amidst racialized trauma, utilizing sculpture, fiber, collage, sound, and performance art practices to explore the journey of healing for Black individuals. Beach's artwork spans various disciplines and is rooted in the experience of Black people of those of African heritage in America. He draws inspiration from the African storytelling tradition and aims to honor his immediate ancestors as well as those of the African diaspora. Performance art plays a crucial role in Beach's work and he creates space where the spirits of the ancestors can rest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our special guest artist and educator, Desmond Beach. Woo! <laughs> well, I, good I told, evening. <laughs> first of all, I told you backstage, I don't even know how you have time to do art. Okay, I don't, I don't. And and the art that you do, ladies and gentlemen, you go, you're gonna see that. I don't even know. Welcome to the show, my man. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here this evening. Thank you. Oh. Wow, wow, wow. On this Good Friday. Good Friday. Yes. Good Friday. On this Good Friday, we got Desmond up in here. Well, you know, you know, Desmond, we I I I, I am the, the gentle giant, the bear. So I always want to get into the personal side of our guests sometimes right up front. So first of all, welcome to our show. And again, and can you do me a favor? Let's talk about young Desmond. Oh, <laughs> okay. Like, let's talk about young Desmond. Like where you grew up, and yeah. how did your childhood play a role in in your career? Wow. Well, I think this must be a move of God because y'all talk about Baltimore all night, and I'm from the great city of Baltimore. Hey. Great city of Baltimore. Hey. Wow. Um, born and raised. I am the middle son of three boys. Grew up in a household with my mother and my father and my grandmother, who was a constant. And it is living in Baltimore. Growing up in Baltimore, I, I really got a sense of who I am and my identity. Growing up in the Black Baptist Church, people can relate to that maybe, right? You're in church on the weekends. You're in all these youth groups. You're in the you're on the usher board. You're in the choir. You're doing Easter Day speeches. Like, that's where I learned how to stand in front of people and talk talk about what's important to me and my passions and and that's where i really um found a foundation and rooted in my faith that is a big part of my creative practice and and making work um it is it's at the core of that you know so i don't take for granted that i grew up in baltimore i grew up in baltimore at a time where it was really challenging to be black you know where it was challenging to be a young black man walking the streets whether there was looking out for the cops that were patrolling the streets or, you know, racial profiling you or just even living around people who were desperate for something else, mm -hmm. seeking something else and trying to find whatever means they could um, to obtain those things. So yeah, I'm from Baltimore, born and raised and love it. I tell everybody it's the greatest city and not just because it's on the park benches. It's a true statement. It's the greatest city. Wow. Come on now. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first. Yeah. <laughs> From the Desmond Beach, Baltimore is the place to be. Baltimore strong. Okay. And lucky for you to grow up with your, your, with your grandmother. That's really amazing. Yeah. Grandmother love and nurturing is very, very important. And to have it in the home is incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Desmond, 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 my, my friend and my brother, my fellow educator, you have an extensive career, obviously, as an educator, including your work as a diversity practitioner at the Field School here in the D.C. area and visiting artist and lecturer at schools such as Chopin State, Emerson College, Morgan State and the Carl College of the Atlantic. Um, my question to you uh -huh. is connections, um, parallels between the work that you do 
and the art that you produce? Well, yeah, like I, I see myself as an educator, right? Like it is who I am and it's really entrenched in my practice. So the same way that I approach being in the classroom with my students and presenting ideas and getting them to question things and want um, to challenge ideas and assumptions, whether that was in the art room or whether it was as the diversity director, right? Like it was always my desire to have people think and challenge their perspectives and want to know more, want to know more beyond their own perspective, wanting to be able um, to see beyond that. And if they had a limitation to recognize a limitation in that and want to learn more, right? So I think my artwork is the exact same thing that I am trying um, to create a, a super large classroom where everyone can come in and we can have conversation around the work that I'm presenting. Because at the end of the day, I want us to have conversations. I want us to learn from the lived experiences, particularly of Black people. So the work is rooted about healing, but it is also a place for others to come and to learn, to, to, see, that, to see that healing take place, to bear witness to the trauma, and then to ask the question, what hand or role do I play in the systemic structure and how can I challenge it and how can I make steps and moves to dismantle it? So yeah, I'm an artist, but I'm an educator. And so they all go together. I'm always in the classroom, whether the studio's the classroom or I'm in a literal classroom, I am always trying to get people to come together um, to talk and to learn something. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> you're taking your learning extremely seriously or that learning process i should say because not only are you teaching but you are also being taught you decided to go back and get a phd in creative practice at the university of plymouth in england what what prompted that um the pandemic prompted that oh. um well part of it and the research of the black lives matter movement um prompted it because while people were taking to the streets and were protesting and were finding other ways to stand up and resist, I kept thinking, well, where's my role in this? Like, how do I enter into this Black Lives Matter movement? And part of my research is about ancestral voices and knowledge and wisdom. And it was my grandmother who passed away about 10 years ago, who said, you need to go back to school, do some work that will teach our people Hmm. how they can be healthy and whole, how they can heal, how they can address that. And so you're a teacher, you're an artist, go take those two things and now pursue this thing. And so I was sitting at home on a couch and I started looking for programs and found myself in Plymouth where I go every summer um, to meet with my advisors and do research. And while I'm here in New York, I'm writing. Actually, I'm almost finished. I just submitted my last document to my advisors. So praise the Lord. That's coming soon. Right. I'm going to be done with it. Um, but yeah, it came out of the Black Lives Matter movement and seeing the brutality on black bodies and going, what do you do? And I said, I'm going to take the master's tools to dismantle the thing that's happening. So I'm going to go in and learn your language. I'm going to go get the credentials so that I can sit at the table and then I can school you on what you're doing and why it's wrong and say, oh, but I got the credentials now, right? Like, it's not me just talking. I want to come with me and the 10,000 angels and ancestors standing behind me. We're going to come in and, and do this work together. So that's how, that's how I got to the PhD. And you went back to England so you can speak the Queen's English as you talk to a guy. <laughs> and, and in the place that's Plymouth, when you think of the pilgrims leaving, like my school is literally like the place where they got on that ship and they set sail. So to go back there and to do this work around trauma, nothing is by accident. And I know that the ancestors and the Holy Spirit conspired together to make this thing happen because it is unreal, all the connections of how I got there. Like it, it's a much longer story of like hearing the voices and having dreams to know that I need to go make this move you know, and, and being literally pulled out of a dream to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> Desmond, <laughs> Desmond <laughs> I, I, you are the reason I created this show. Wow. Just listening to you made me know that what Bobby and Vosh and I do every week 
it 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 has great meaning. Thank you, first of all, for sharing that. Um, wow. Um, look, I know that you're a man on the move, okay? And you mentioned that you're from Baltimore. Yes. Uh, but I want to know what motivated your transition from secondary education to relocating to New York to pursue your art career on a full-time basis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, again, <laughs> not me. It's those ancestors, <laughs> you know, it, it's... <laughs> It's that grandmother of mine, let's say her name, Ruth Brown. It is that woman um, who was all of like four, six, four, seven, small stature women, but so mighty in her presence that during a pandemic, I had a moment to sit, to be still and to look at my life and to say, you've been in education for 20 years. Is this where you're going to end this thing or is there still more to do? And the answer was, there's more to do. So my grandmother said, go get the PhD, but that's not it. That's now going to be your next um, life's work, is to do this healing work for what I've coined in my PhD is the Black congregation. Everybody is of African descent. We are part of the Black congregation. And so it, it is this, I, so that's part of it. So sitting there, I knew I had to make a move. I, I was, and Bobby knows this because we talk this all the time. I was experiencing burnout because when you do diversity work in predominantly white institutions for more than a decade, it takes a toll on you physically and emotionally and spiritually. And I was feeling like I had nothing left to give. And so I know the pandemic was horrific for some people, but it was a blessing for me because it allowed for me to sit and to be still for a moment and to collect myself and think about where I want to go next. And so that's when I really started to get in tune and to hear the ancestral voices say, here is the next assignment for you and the work you must do. And so that's why I left education because that moment at a secondary education, that was coming to a close. And then the research now, and it's so funny because we see all over the South that governments are trying to get rid of diversity initiatives within universities and colleges and state schools. But they've set me up now to talk about, let's do this work on a higher level and let's take the research to places, right? So let's go to college campuses and present the research and ideas. Let's go do this and let's go do that. That's another example to me of how when you're in alignment, that things begin to open up, you know? And so it was just necessary. I had to leave secondary education so I could now take on the next part of my life to do this healing work and take it in an academic level, but also in a spiritual level. So I'm trying to reach people from all from all, all places. You know, let's get in the room and talk academically about the work, but let's talk, let's do the heart work too. Let's talk about it, you know, out on a corner. Let's talk about it right now, like on this platform. Let's talk about it in church. Let's talk about it when we're sitting at the dinner room table. Like it is now doing that work that I had to leave school the secondary school, so that my influence could be bigger, so that my accessibility could be bigger and larger. Um, not that I was um, in any kind of way in a box doing the work, but I just realized that assignment has now shifted and it shifted to a new thing and, and, and more people. I'm very grateful for the time that I spent working with young people and the influence to help them see themselves and to see others in new ways. But I also know that that has to go to, to more people and that I have more people that I have to reach because they're waiting for Desmond to get there. And so mm -hmm. I, I got to do the work. Wow. You talk about being a big influence. So it raises the question for me. So who were the early influences? Who or what were the early influences? For Desmond, we often ask artists when they come here that are singers who influence you. And, and we've been asking all of our artists this month, who or what were your early influences? Yeah. Well, I wish that I could say that they were artists, right? I wish I could say, oh, when I was eight and nine and 10, I knew artists and I, and I knew who they were. But those weren't my influences. My influences were my family. You know, it was it was my parents, my grandparents. My uncle Joe, who lived in New York, which is also funny that now I'm living in a city that he lived in for 30 years, right? Pursuing paths that he pursued, right? 
it was people in my life. The people that were around me were my biggest influences. And those are the ones that I draw from in making the work. Um, and, and, and my church family. Hello, Mount Lebanon Baptist Church in Baltimore. I hope you're watching it tonight. <laughs> you know, because it was, it was also there. I mean, I, I think about all the church mothers and fathers and aunties and uncles that helped to raise me, right, and nurture me and pour into my life. I see the work I'm doing as a way of honoring them. Like my success is their success, right? Like we share in this thing. And so those are my biggest influences. Like as I got older, then I started to, to see artists and, you know, whether it was um, Renee Stout, who, who, who is a DC um, native artist, you know, who, who, who works there in DC or whether it was um, people like Betty Saar, um, who I love her work. I had a chance to meet her at her gallery in New York one time, or whether it's Faith Ringroad who tells great stories through her quilting and, and printmaking, right? So there were artists like that who I was looking at when I became like a teenager, you know, that helped to start to guide my work. I call them my artistic elders, you know, like they're my guides. Like it's from their work and aesthetics that I find my place within making work, um, as a black artist or just as an artist. But yeah, I would say my first influences were those adults that are around me, the ones that were helping to pour in the values that I still hold um, today, you okay. know, which is why I had to go to church today, which I, and I felt bad I couldn't find a church, but I was like, <laughs> I can't find one tonight, but <laughs> you know. The ancestors will forgive you this time. They, <laughs> Please, well, I hope they will. <laughs> no, bring your ministry to the house of he said, he said, he said. Amen. Okay, and you are here. Okay, and we it is being received. All right. All right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. So Desmond, as an artist, you perceive your role to extend beyond just creating objects. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you and how does that manifest? Yeah. So um, I've been talking a lot about this, right? Like there is like this spirit, there is this energy that's out there. And so, yes, I'm a creator of objects. I make tangible things and sometimes things that aren't tangible. Sometimes they're just moments that you can experience with me in a performance or a blessing. But those objects are more than that. I feel that when I'm making work in my studio, it is a divine act and that those objects did embody a sense of spirit and a sense of self that is bigger and greater than I am that will live on when I'm no longer on the on the planet, right? Like I, they hold energy in a way that I think speaks to people's hearts and their spirits that isn't all my doing. Like I feel it's divine work in that. And, and people have told me often, even looking through the computer screen, that there's something about your work that's beyond its aesthetics of it being beautiful or being pleasing to the eye, but that it hits me someplace in my core. And when I'm making the work in my studio, the same thing is happening to me. Like I am ministering to my own hurts and my own pain and my own trauma of living in this black body. And I think it is also taking my own healing and restoration that also finds its way into those objects. Um, even so that when somebody purchases a work, I give them a protocol for how they are to treat the work and engage with the work because it is this living thing beyond just a painting on the wall, but that it is something that was met with clear intentions to do something for Black people, you know, to bring about healing. And so because of that, its intention is not just for you to admire it just because um, it's beautifully done, but it's also meant to like hit you at the core as well. So that's what I mean about the, it's more than just an object, you know? Yeah. It's an experience. It's a connection. It's yeah. yeah. It's so I'm going to, I'm going to take a moment. First of all, these folks have come on here. They, uh, because Desmond's on the show. So hello, JJ. Uh, thank you for JJ says hi to us. Thank you for joining the show tonight. Mannequin madness. Thank you. I thank you for loving my hat. Um, I, <laughs> I really beauty. appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Desmond, when did you know? that you were an artist? When did you like look at yourself and say, I am an artist? Tell us about that moment. Okay, if I could be real cheeky about it, <laughs> I would say 
I knew I was an artist when I was in the fourth grade. So that's around eight or nine years old, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the reason I know that that's the moment was because, and this is not good for the teacher. I mean, I guess it was good for me as a teacher now to know this. But when I was a student, I always waited to the last moment to get a, an assignment done. I wasn't one of those kids that did things ahead of time. And I had this map assignment for my social studies class that I had to get done. And I hadn't told my parents I needed supplies or anything at all. But I'm creative. I'm resourceful. I look around my house and on our table, dining room table, my mom had a bowl of peanuts in shells. She was also a florist and had a vase that had glass marbles in it. I said, I'm going to take those things and make and make a map. And I took peanut shells and glass marbles, <laughs> made a map, went into my fourth, my, my fourth grade class. And the teacher was like, this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> she called in other teachers into the classroom <laughs> to see it. And I went, oh, I can get this kind of attention just by making something. <laughs> oh, I want to do this <laughs> forever. And so... Now that I think it back about it, like that was the moment I became an artist because I made something, people saw it and experienced it, and they gave me affirmation. They they validated me and what I had done and had been moved by it. And so that is the first moment I knew I was an artist. Wow. And now I'm still trying to pursue that. I'm still trying to reach to get that. That's so why I make something back to being that that fourth grader when they made that first map with the marbles and peanut shells. <laughs> we call that chasing the dragon. <laughs> chasing the dragon. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. <laughs> you know, Desmond, I think that you alluded to this a little earlier in one of your answers in terms of, you know, the scope and the depth and the broth, uh, the breadth that you yeah. hope your art um, exposes people and teaches people. But, you know, but is there an attended audience? Is there a, a target audience more so than just general observation that, that when you create your artwork that you're thinking of? Yes, I'm thinking of black people. I'm thinking of black people, particular um, those of us who have trauma that sits in our bodies as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. For those of us who are black and live under systems of oppression, whether it is living in the US under this, this, this government that legalizes the killing of black bodies, um, whether it is to my brothers and sisters in other countries or other continents that also experience persecution because they live in brown and black skin. I'm thinking about them ultimately, that I want to make something that connects to their humanity so they can be seen and affirmed and know that I hear them and see them and that their story is so important. So I'm making it for them. But then I recognize that the byproduct is that other people will see the work as well. And I hope that they will then learn from the work and will question the roles that they play and why Black people experience racialized trauma, why we are living under the weight of stigma racism. I want them to look at that as well. When I was younger and first making work, when I was like in undergrad and grad school, I was making work solely for white people because I wanted to teach white people how their humanity never showed up because if it did, they would not have allowed what happened to black bodies happen to black bodies. So I was so my work was always very loud and very and full of anger and rage. And as I matured as an artist, I recognized that the work had to be to heal for black people. And that if we did the work, if we healed we were the most important in this moment that others would then get what they need from it as well. So I think that white people who come to galleries to see my work, or museums see my work, I think they're moved because they see the humanity now and it, it taps into their humanity and it makes them question how they show up in spaces. So yeah, I hope that gets to that question. Like I make it for black people. I want us to heal. I it's, want us to, yeah. It definitely does. And it, and it so beautifully um, describes a very, comparable experience that I've always felt when I've attended the African American, you know, the Museum of African American History and Culture. Like I know that the purpose of that museum is for us as black people. Yeah. I know that when other people go there, they are learned because when you go, 
there's there's looking at the artifacts. And for me, there is also the process of looking at people who are processing those yeah. artifacts and the different ways it shows up based upon the walk of your own journey. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Thank you. You speak a lot about the ancestors and their your connection to you. Uh, you also know or talk about ancestral knowledge. How does that influence your work? Yeah, well, th that's a really good question. <laughs> um, the way it influences is that, and my, if I describe it to the audience, it's the same thing when you're sitting in church or in worship and like you feel that you hear the spirit of God speaking to you and telling you how to like, answering the hurts that you have or the questions you're worried about in this moment. The same thing is true for me when it comes to ancestral voices. When I get into my studio, I, before I walk in, I say a prayer. And as I walk in, I feel that they come to greet me. Like I even go, hi, grandma, as I'm walking down the hallway. Come on, y'all, let's go make the work, right? Like, And I, sometimes I feel like they say, where you been? We haven't seen you for a couple of days. Where you been, boy? You know, kind of <laughs> thing. And so I'm in this space. I'm thinking about the times I spent with them. I'm thinking about all the conversations we've had and I'm making work that I think is a representation of that thing. And when I bring in my Western world education, you know, which I was classically trained as an artist to then make a piece that I think follows the art rules, then the work is not what they want it to be. And it goes flat and it's never successful. My work is only successful when I lean into hearing their voices or the dreams that I have at night that tells me like the next thing I need to make or how to make, or when I'm sitting in church and I get, a, I remember my grandmother sitting like across the pew from me. And then I get an idea about, Oh, I will make a piece about this. That to me is a signal of ancestral knowledge because it's bringing back to my remembrance, a moment in time that I spent with her. And so when I make work that's in tune with that, it goes well. When I go in on with my own assertions, with my own idea, uh, I'm going to do this thing. I can spend eight, 10 hours and a piece goes nowhere. It looks like trash and I want to throw it away. And so that's how I know I have to stay in alignment <laughs> with the ancestors. Because when I do, I make work that's really good. And when I don't, it's trash. <laughs> it's trash. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to see some treasures because <laughs> we're going to uh, give the stage to, to Desmond and we're going to show several pieces of his artwork and he's going to tell us about them. So if you're ready, let's, you guys get ready. Um, take it away, Desmond. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. This is wonderful. Okay. So this piece is called um, Beautifully Posed. And so it is an image of a woman who was um, recently after emancipation um, that I wanted to like bring to a large scale. I do a lot of combing through archives at the National uh, Library of Congress, through the Smithsonian, because I'm really looking to try to find my ancestors, my family members. Like the archives are like a big family album to me, because you know, part of us, it's hard to know our entire family tree because of the enslavement of black bodies, right? And so I use the archive as a way of trying to find my relatives. And when I get struck by an image, that's my cue that I need to do something with it. And so this piece is really large. It's 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 over six feet. Um, it is a, it's a painting that I did that then was woven into a piece of fabric. Um, and I put the, the the glass beads as a way of trying to give a nod back to our ancestral heritage of coming from the continent, from the motherland, with her dressed in this European attire going, bringing the two worlds together, you know, like would this really have been my reality had it not been for this thing? So I'm trying to speak to that history, but also um, speak to the reality of where she is right now in this moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this piece is called Sister Said Hush Now. <laughs> Sister Said Hush Now. And um, this piece is something I, I just recently completed it. And it's really special to me because I think this, I made this piece out of a conversation I had with some female friends of mine that said, because we don't see women showing up in your work. Like you have a lot of men in your work. Why are they not females? And I said, well, because I don't think I have the right to speak on the female experience. 
I can speak on my experience. And, and my friend said, no, you got to tell the whole story. Tell the whole story. And so um, this is an image of a woman um, that also found in archives. She's unknown. I don't know her name. But I love the juxtaposition that I did with the big satchel on her head that's carrying something in it. There is physical weight there. And then the big hoop of her skirt is the emotional weight that I think that Black women have to bear. And so you maybe, if you can gleam it in some kind of way, it's an image of someone who's, who's weeping and crying with images of people being lynched. And so it is, it's, it's had this conversation of the burden Black women have to endure the physical weight of being black, being female, but also the emotional burden that they have to carry for the community. And it's it's on a quilt because I use quilts as a way of connecting um, to home and to a sense of security and safety and comfort. And the work I'm gonna show you really came out of this idea of, I was so hurt by seeing Michael Brown's body lay in the street uncovered for hours while his family was just traumatized and kept thinking that no one covered his body up. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a crocheter, was like, I, I was thinking if I would have ran in my house, I would have gotten one of her crochet blankets off the couch and ran outside. And so the next work I'm going to show you in this work is all about this idea of making these blankets that would be used to show our hurt and pain but also protect us at the same time. So yes, we can go to the next image and you just click through them. And because it this yeah. is called bearing down where this young black boy has the burden of the Black Lives Matter movement on his back that he's trying to carry, you know, like it, it's speaking to our reality. And even what I think the reality would be for the next generation to come, that they're going to have to bear this weight. Next one. Um, this one is called my parents had to give me the talk. And so <laughs> here is this black boy in the front that's seated looking with me in the background, holding someone who may, may have passed away or may I just hold him in a gentle brace. But there's some ambiguity there just so that you can question what's happening here. But this idea of that black families have to sit down and have a conversation with their children about the reality of where they live. Yes, next one, please. Mm. This one is called um, Penetrating the Shadows. So here it is again, this young black woman, her innocence, her beauty in the foreground with this image of this black body being lynched that's been repeated over and over again around the halo, um, trying to speak to that brutality of innocence and who she is and and do you see her humanity, but why all these horrific things are happening in the background, you know, trying to bring and bridge those two worlds together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this one is called Reverberations from the Past. So again, there's this young black boy in the center looking at the viewer. Like you can't get away from his escapes of his gaze and his eyes while the image of a black woman in the background is kissing the forehead of her child that has an overlaid image from those lynching postcards where white spectators would pose in front of lynched bodies and send them to their friends and families across the country. And so again, I'm trying to bring in this duality of living in this double consciousness, this double world of being black and American and having these lived experiences that are so layered and complicated. It's not just one, one narrative. Yes, next image, please. Uh, this one is called Ebony Flesh. Um, and this is an image of, of a black man's mugshot recently after emancipation, when we started moving from enslavement to then putting them in prisons, still as enslaved bodies, um, because we wanted to find a way to still control black people. And so on his face is an image that I drew of, again, for those postcards where white spectators stand around while lynches are happening. This one is of a body burning. And then lower underneath his chin is an image from the Black Lives Matter movement where this guy is raising his middle fingers up um, at the police and all that kind of stuff. And so I see it as him, the contemporary guy, raising his middle fingers up to the historic people who were at the lynching going, look at y'all. Y'all still doing the same thing, same thing. We're still mm -hmm. fighting the same story. Wow. Oh. And this is probably my most recent piece. 
the one I just completed most recently. It's called Freight. And um, this is like 82 inches by 82 inches. It, it fits a queen size bed if you're wondering like scale of, of the size of it all. But this idea of putting a black woman um, in this crate, is she a commodity? Can we just use her up? How do we see her humanity? Like, how do we really see her? Um, is she just an object? And I thought about this a lot because we kept saying black women are going to save the world. Black women are going to save America. And yes, I think that's going to be true because they're so resilient. But I also think that's such a burden and weight to put on a group of people because to think you have to save the world, like what am I? You know, like this idea of, of how we see the black female body and how we either have ownership of it or don't have ownership of it. Like this idea of um, just that. So this is the piece trying to have that conversation of the contem contemporary woman, but she's in like this crate you would see like on a, you would pick up produce like in a field. You know, this idea, can we just pluck another one off and just get all we can black women so they can save us all, you know, um, instead of seeing where we show up in the story as well and how do we address the issues and concerns as well. Thank you. Desmond, your, your work is absolutely amazing. <laughs> and Monica summed it up perfectly. She said, thank you for commenting on pain with such care and beauty, remarkable work. We mm. do not want to let you go. Um, but the best thing that we can do is to tell people what's next for you and how can people continue to follow you and support you? Yes. So you can follow me on Instagram. It's simply at Desmond Beach. You can go to my website and you can find my newsletter there. You can sign up for my newsletter. I send out quarterly updates of what's happening, all my exhibitions, performances, um, where you'll see my work next. Um, so you can follow me there and we can stay in contact with one another. We can stay in Lovely. touch. Lovely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Vosh said, we do not want to let Desmond go, but we are, we have run out of time. Desmond, first, let me just say again and again and again, thank you for being here. Thank you for closing out our series. Thank you for your, just your, your spirit. I mean, Bobby told us a little bit about you, but he didn't tell us all this. Okay. And I am so blessed. I am, I am so blessed to, to have you here. So thank you again for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are starting off April strong. Um, and next week on April the 5th, we will have Jerome Braggs here. He's the author of Only Feed Me Life. Uh, it is a book of his poems that is just incredible. You definitely you definitely have to, to meet him. So tune in next week. Uh, our words of the week this week. Art is an adventure into an unknown world, which can be explored only by those willing to take risks. And that is a quote by Mark Rothko. And, you know, again, this has been a great show. And we have to close the show this week, um, paying tribute to someone who died just today, Louis Gossett Jr. Uh, he passed away today. He was 87 years old. He was the first Black male actor to win an Oscar in a supporting role. And we are sending prayers to uh, Louis Gossett Jr.'s family and to everyone who has known him and who has worked with him. Uh, we we uh, send our prayers. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us tonight to close out our March for Art series with Desmond <laughs> Beach. And we look forward to seeing you all next week on a new episode of He Said. He Said. He Said. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Thank you. <laughs>